On August 18, 1971, a father and son on a road trip stopped for the night near mile marker 35 of the Redwood Highway in Josephine County, Oregon, just outside of Cave Junction. The following morning, while walking in the woods, they discovered a set of skeletal remains. Examination of the remains revealed that they had belonged to a young woman. Found with them were two rings, one of which featured Mother of Pearl and had the initials A.L. scratched onto it. There were no other clues as to the identity of the young woman. When the young woman was not identified through the initial, extensive investigation after her discovery, her case became inactive, filed away as Jane Doe, Josephine County, 17-940. As technologies advanced over the ensuing years, the Josephine County Sheriff's Office did their best to utilize them in hopes of identifying their Jane Doe. A clay bust of what Jane Doe may have looked like in life was created in 2004. It was at this time that Jane Doe received the nickname Jane Annie Doe from Clackamas County Sheriff's Deputy Joyce Nagy, the forensic artist who created the bust. Other forensic images of Annie's presumed appearance were eventually developed as well, but the circulation of all these images brought forward many leads, but no answers. In 2016, isotope analysis of Annie's teeth, bones, and hair was used to estimate where Annie may have been born and lived, but likewise did not result in an identification. No matches to Annie's DNA were ever found in law enforcement databases. In November 2018, Annie's DNA was sent to the DNA Doe Project to be run through GEDmatch, an online open source genetic genealogy database. Volunteers found several individuals who shared DNA with Annie in the database but they were mostly distant cousins who lived outside of the United States. Through a fifth cousin of Annie's living in New Zealand, volunteers created an elaborate family tree to try to identify individuals who could be Annie. It took several weeks of combing through records from England, New Zealand, the United States, and Canada to come up with a potential identity for Annie. In February 2019, the DNA Doe Project informed Detective Ken Selig that they had found a potential match for Annie, and that this match had a sister living in Washington State. The sister was contacted and provided a DNA sample. When the sample was tested and compared to Annie, it confirmed that Annie was the woman's sister. On March 14, 2019, the Josephine County Sheriff's Office announced that their Jane Annie Doe was Anne Marie Lehman of Aberdeen, Washington. Coincidentally, she had also been nicknamed Annie by her family. She had been 16 when she went missing, and would have turned 65 this year had she lived. While the mystery of Jane Annie Doe's identity has been solved, it is still unclear how she met her fate and how she ended up in Oregon. She may have simply run away from home, but it is believed that she may have been trafficked. These allegations, as well as the cause of her death, remain under investigation. Pamela Kahanis was the second youngest child in a large family. She had two brothers and five sisters. She grew up on a dairy farm just outside of Stillwater, Minnesota. As much as she loved spending time with her family, she had a strong desire to see what else the world had to offer. As an adult, she first moved to St. Paul to work for a publishing company, but that proved not to be a big enough adventure for her. She decided at age 25 to enlist in the Navy. In May of 1984, she was sent to the Orlando Naval Training Center in Florida for basic training. She graduated on August 3, 1984. Just two days later, a passing driver spotted Pamela's body in the side lot of a vacant home in an unincorporated area of Sanford, Florida. Her white naval uniform was found nearby. Pamela had been beaten and strangled. Police were able to put together an extensive timeline of Pamela's activity on August 4th, based on receipts and statements from witnesses. Pamela had gone shopping at Orlando's Fashion Street Mall and a nearby Kmart, where witnesses saw her with a man. She was also seen with a man at a bar on the Navy base around 7 o'clock that night. It is unclear if it was the same man she was seen with at Kmart. 
The man, or men, did not come forward and were not identified by police. DNA was found on Pamela's body, but a match was never found in police databases. After Pamela's case had long gone cold, the Seminole County Sheriff's Office decided to hire a pair of Bond Nano Labs to use genetic genealogy to construct a family tree of the killer to hopefully identify him. They identified a potential suspect, and authorities surveilled him and collected a covert DNA sample from his trash on items including a cigarette butt and used dental floss. It was a match to the DNA at the crime scene. On March 13, 2019, 59-year-old Thomas Lewis Garner was arrested for Pamela's murder. Garner had been a classmate of Pamela's at the Naval Training Center, and the two knew each other, according to the sheriff's office. He had one minor battery charge while serving in the Navy, but no other criminal record. At the time of his arrest, he was working as a dental hygienist in Jacksonville, Florida. Garner has denied involvement in the crime. He was originally granted a bond of a quarter of a million dollars, but it was rescinded just a day later. His lawyer is currently trying to get it reinstated, so that his client does not have to remain in jail until his trial. Pamela's father passed away in 2001, and her mother died in 2016, never seeing an arrest in their daughter's case. One of Pamela's sisters has said in a statement that while she and her siblings are in shock over the fact that an arrest was finally made after almost 35 years, they had never given up hope that the day would come. The family announced the news of an arrest being made in Pamela's case on a billboard outside their farm. July 31st, 1999, was J.B. Beasley's 17th birthday. She and her friend Tracy Howlett planned to drive together to a field party that was being held to celebrate it a few miles north of their hometown of Dothan, Alabama. The pair left in J.B.'s black 1993 Mazda just after 10 p.m. The girls got lost trying to find the party, ultimately ending up in the town of Ozark, roughly 20 miles northwest of Dothan. Around 11.30 p.m., they were in the parking lot of a convenience store that had closed for the night just a half hour before. They got directions back to the road that would take them home from a woman they ran into in the parking lot. Tracy called her mother, Carol Roberts, to tell her that the two had gotten lost and were coming home instead of trying to make it to the party. Tracy told her mother that she loved her before hanging up. The woman who gave the girls directions saw them drive out of the parking lot, heading in the correct direction. When the girls did not arrive home by dawn the next morning, Carol Roberts called the police. JB's Mazda was found around 9 a.m. that morning in Ozark, less than a mile from the convenience store JB and Tracy were last seen at. There were no signs of anything out of place in the vehicle until police opened the trunk and discovered the bodies of the two girls. They had both been shot. In the fall of 2018, the Ozark Police Department hired Parabon Nanolabs to use genetic genealogy to try to match DNA found at the scene of the crime to a suspect. Parabon uploaded the DNA sequence to GEDmatch, but the only matches in the database were very distant, and Parabon was only able to narrow down the search to a particular extended family. The Ozark Police Department began collecting voluntary samples from individuals in that family in hopes of figuring out where their suspect belonged in it. One of the voluntarily provided samples turned out to be an exact match to the sample found at the crime scene. On March 16, 2019, police arrested the individual who provided that sample, 45-year-old Coley McCraney. McCraney is a truck driver and a preacher who had not previously been a suspect in the case. He denies any involvement with the murders. He is being charged with capital murder and rape, and the district attorney has announced plans to seek the death penalty. A preliminary hearing in the case is scheduled for April 3rd. On June 9, 1969, childhood sweethearts Clifford Bernhardt and Linda Reich were married at the Pilgrim Congregational Church in Billings, Montana. Clifford was a Vietnam veteran who had received a Purple Heart during his service. 
The Bernhardts spent the next several years working hard to build their lives together. Linda wanted to become a teacher one day and worked at a distribution warehouse while her husband worked pouring concrete. The couple worked together at a second job, cleaning carpets at night. Because of their hardworking nature, their families knew that something was wrong when Clifford and Linda did not show up for their night job on November 6th, 1973. The following morning, Linda's mother went to their house to check on them. When she did not get an answer at the door, she forced her way inside the house. There, she found the bodies of her son-in-law and daughter. They had both been 24. Clifford had suffered a major head wound, and they had both been strangled after being tied up for some time. Linda had been sexually assaulted, and all of her underwear had been removed from the home. There was no sign of forced entry into the house, and it appeared as though the Bernhardts had a guest at dinner the night before, leading police to believe that the couple may have known their killer. This did not help them make an arrest in the case, however, and the case went cold. Police did not give up on finding Clifford and Linda's killer, though. In 2004, they re-examined evidence from the crime scene and obtained a DNA sample. In 2015, they contacted Parabon Nanolabs to use their snapshot DNA analysis to create a composite image of what the killer may have looked like based on his genes. At the end of 2018, Parabon uploaded the DNA to GEDmatch and performed genealogical research to find the killer's family. On January 3rd, 2019, Parabon informed police that they had a lead in identifying a suspect. They had narrowed down the search to two individuals. These two individuals were very closely related, however, so further examination of their DNA would be needed to confirm which one of them was a suspect. One of the individuals agreed to provide a DNA sample. After careful examination of this individual's genetic code, it was confirmed by the Montana State Crime Lab that the sample came not from the individual who volunteered his DNA, but from the other potential suspect. On March 25, 2019, the Yellowstone County Sheriff's Office announced that the other potential suspect was Cecil Stan Caldwell, who had been a co-worker of Linda's at the warehouse. Caldwell died in 2003, at the age of 59, and therefore cannot be brought to trial for the murders. While Caldwell cannot legally be declared the couple's killer, identifying him through the DNA at the crime scene has given Clifford and Linda's families some answers to the questions that have haunted them for the past 46 years.